Fabrit, good morning. How do you feel? Can you do this? I see very, es redzu, ka jūs esat ļoti lēni un pagaidām vēl miegaini, very slow and still a little bit sleepy. Um, es gribētu pajautāt, vai visiem ir pieņems, ka mūsu darba valoda šodien ir angļu valoda? Un ka arī prezentācijas par Latviju ir angļu valodā? Klusēšana, piekrišana, tā kā neviens skaļi neievilst. Nē, nu, pirmo prezentāciju es varētu arī latviešu valodā, ja jūs ļoti uzstātu, bet ja jūs neuzstājat, tad, tad, tad es tomēr dodu priekšroku angļu valodā, lai mūsu ārvalstu viesi arī var saprast. <laughs> Labi, tad vienojamies, ka mēs tiešām arī par Latviju runājam angļu valodā, ja gadījumā kādam ir kaut kas neskaidrs, nesaprotams, tad droši jautājat, pārtulkosim kopā ar kolēģiem un kaut kā tiksim kopīgi uz priekšu. So, uh, we just agreed that uh, all presentations will be in English, also the one about Latvia's situation. So, good for you. <laughs> um, I must say that today I'm both excited and a little bit sad. Uh, first, why I'm sad? I'm sad actually because uh, the weather that I see now uh, outside of our nice premises in the ministry here, I see that the climate actually already has changed. We all know that this spring we had very untypical uh, weather here in Latvia. It was extremely warm. Not to say that it was very, very hot here in, in, in Latvia. We had more than 30 degrees very early in, in springtime. And that is not typical. And as a climate specialist, I would say that that is due to climate change. Uh, and I'm sad because that means that climate change is already happening and we now have to think not only about mitigating climate change but also about adapting to climate change. The other side, uh, I said that I'm excited and why I'm excited, it's because of the same uh, uh, event outside the window because it's becoming warmer. I think it should become easier to speak about climate change because we all know that it is very hard to speak about those uh, things, those activities which we can't feel, which we can't see, which we can't touch. And now when we start to see uh, climate change in reality, I think it should become easier for us to talk about it. It should become easier for us uh, to, to agree on, on activities, on measures to mit mitigate climate change. And from that point of view, I'm excited. Although I must say that I'm not glad about the fact that I'm seeing no climate change. I would prefer uh, having eliminated climate change already before some time ago. Uh, when that's said, that, uh, I would like to introduce maybe briefly with the agenda we have today and myself. Uh, my name is Ilze Prusa. I'm director of climate department uh, and I'm responsible for climate policy development in Latvia. Recently, my department also has started to think about adaptation to climate change because, as I mentioned already, uh, unfortunately, climate change is already our reality and we think also about adaptation nowadays. We also have a um, distinguished panel from the European Commission. Uh, I would maybe like to ask themselves to introduce what they are doing, what they are responsible for. Okay, you already have a mic or? Okay, when, once I know how it works. Uh, I'm Derte Pardo Lopez. Uh, my name already shows that I'm European. Actually, I'm a citizen of the world. My husband is Chilean, Pardo Lopez. Spanish origin, and Dörte, well, my mom actually is of Danish origin, and to add a bit of spice, my dad is of Latvian origin. But I'm sorry, I don't speak any Latvian. I work actually as the program, man program manager for life projects, life nature projects in Spain. And I'm here today because uh, I would like to share with you my excitement about the new program, the new LIFE program, to tell you a bit about especially the LIFE environment part, which I know much better than the climate part, I have to admit. Uh, you should know that today actually is a day off at the Commission, so I'm on my holidays, which shows you that I'm really, really interested in this program. I love it, and I think it's very, very important. It's important for the climate change part, it's important for the nature part, it's important for the resource efficiency part and for the information governance. 
That's all that I will share with you today. Um, maybe my special interest also stems from the fact that I'm the coordinator and co-author of the multi-annual work program for life for the next four years. And so I think I really know a bit about it. Thank you. I'll pass the word on to James. Good morning. I am, I am a citizen of the world, but I'm very English. So my parents are both English and I'm English. Um, I, I dare not say UK because we may not have a UK much longer uh, if the Scots decide to disappear. Um, I'm here really by invitation. I've been working with the Commission for the last five or six years, both to monitor and evaluate the current life programme, but also to help develop the climate action sub-programme. So I was invited to provide some thoughts about how the climate sub-programme might operate. Uh, it will op be operating in quite a crowded policy space. Um, so quite how we shape and frame projects under the sub-programme is a matter of uh, testing and demonstration in its own right. Uh, but we'll, we'll be talking about that later on. But thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, as you see, we have a very interesting and very, very, very um, knowledgeable panel today, a very interested panel in our topic, so I think that's very good. Today we will have um, several presentations from our panel, and also we will have a video, and I would like to walk you through agenda that we have for today very, very quickly. Uh, so first I will start with uh, national background and context for life. I will tell you uh, what is our climate policy in Latvia, what problems we currently have, and what are our plans for the future. Then we will have a video. I hope that will be a nice video with, with nice sceneries and, and um, so something very interesting uh, and entertaining. Uh, then we will continue with general introduction about life program. Uh, and especially about environmental sub-program. And afterwards we will uh, more closely look at uh, life climate action. Uh, first there will be general introduction and then we will speak more precisely about different uh, possibilities to, to attract financing from uh, life climate action program. Uh, initial, uh, the first will be presentation on open call proposals and then we will speak about integrated projects and financial instruments um, at the end, there will be some presentations of live projects, and uh, that's about it. Uh, maybe there is something you would like to add about the agenda? Just, just a little thing, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, since we're going to have lunch practically on the spot, so we're kind of imprisoned here, um, I would just like to make sure that you know that I'm here to answer questions during the lunch break. So I will probably be just sitting here and just please come up. If I can't answer, then I will come back to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, just maybe um, as a small reminder, there is also um, my colleague here. Uh, Sophia, who has just uh, walked outside, but she will come back. And, and she is the person who is our national contact point for climate activities. Uh, and, and whenever questions you have, you can ask her, and, and she will try to help you and assist you. Okay? When she will come back, I will once again uh, flag uh, who is she, and, and you will be able to familiarize her. Um, now, maybe we can agree about the way how we are working as regards questions for the presentations. I would suggest that we are taking questions just right after each presentation, if that is okay for you. Okay, good. Then that's agreed. And as about presentations, will they be available after the workshop for everybody's distribution? Yes, so probably we will send them to email or post it on the internet and you will be able to, to receive them and you so therefore don't have to write down all the details that are put on the slides. Um, so that would be briefly all about agenda. Maybe some questions about practical organizational issues here. I see there are none, so uh, I think we can start. 
Uh, and uh, as said before, I will start with a presentation about uh, Latvia's climate policy. Uh, while Sofia, she is the person I was talking about, National Contact Point for Climate Activities, uh, while she is looking for the presentation, um, I can maybe um, briefly tell you uh, that uh, with climate policy, Latvia is dealing already uh, many, many years. Yes, Sofia, thank you. <laughs> Uh, many, many years, and, and, and we have a special department, as you heard, uh, with, with two divisions. There is a division more closely dealing with financial issues and technological issues, and another division which is dealing with policy development uh, issues. And of course, our ministry is cooperating very closely with other ministries, as it happens so that uh, climate policy is very uh, integrated into other policies. Uh, we can't implement our climate policy if we are not cooperating with the Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Agriculture, because they are the ones who are responsible for uh, uh, sectoral policies and they are the ones who can actually implement the measures we need to implement our climate policy. So we closely cooperate. Uh, now I will kick off with the presentation. Um, and first I will tell you briefly Latvia's context. You all are from Latvia, so you think you know Latvia's context, but um, probably I would like to make some uh, emphasis on, on, on particular aspects which are very important for climate policies development. Then I will continue with Latvia's targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions. I will explain you how large or small they are and what do they mean for Latvia. Uh, then I will tell you where does, yes, where do emissions uh, come from in Latvia. In, in these live projects. And I also will mention uh, what is important for Latvia as regards adaptation to climate change because uh, you will later hear that you can make uh, um, live projects both regarding climate change mitigation and uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, then I will just make a very short introduction to Latvia's climate policy, to the main documents. Probably that will be useful for you when you will prepare your live project proposals. And I will tell you about current financial sources that we were using for climate project financing. Um, probably many of you have heard about climate change financial instruments, so I will briefly also touch upon that issue. And at the end of the presentation, I will uh, make a note on, on, to my opinion, main challenges for Latvia as regards climate change. And I hope you will, at the end of this workshop, uh, help us to solve them. So let's start. First about Latvia's context. Um, firstly, and most importantly, uh, climate change is taking place, as already it was mentioned, and they are accelerating. Uh, we have also different commitments, both at EU level and at international level. And these commitments are both uh, related to uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction and uh, greenhouse gas emissions removals. So taking this into account, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, however, at the same time, we also need to preserve uh, removals of uh, CO2 emissions. And if possible, we need to uh, increase uh, these reductions and we need to increase also these removals. Uh, secondly, um, it is important to note that uh, climate change impacts are becoming more and more extensive and more, imp more important and significant for us. So we need to already now start thinking about climate change adaptation. Uh, that is the topic, as I mentioned, of several times already today, is a topic we haven't been thinking about a year or two ago. This is really very, very topical issue for us in Latvia. Then, of course, um, we always like to think in money terms. And uh, as regards money, then we all know that our economy here in Latvia is very small. And GDP per capita is, on average, smaller than within EU. So we need to reduce emissions, but at the same time, we uh, have to do it in a way that we are not precluding our economic development, in a way that we are not reducing our economic development. And if we speak about climate change mitigation, I can tell you that it is possible. Uh, it is not easy, but it is possible. 
And then finally, uh, of course, again about money, we have very limited possibilities of uh, funding. Uh, there is uh, very strict limitations both at private sector and at public sector, so we need to invest very smart. Uh, we need to invest in the most optimal solutions, in cost-efficient solutions, and we need to be able to find them. And I think these are very, very important points to take away regarding Latvia when we speak about climate policy. Uh, now let's look at the emissions of Latvia and here you can see a very interesting graph. You see that there are some bars going up and some bars going down. Uh, the bars which are going up are uh, describing uh, Latvia's greenhouse gas emissions, but the bars that are going down are describing uh, CO2 emissions removals that Latvia has. And probably you will notice that actually those bars which are going down are very very, very big ones. And Latvia is one of the few countries uh, which uh, have a possibility to say that uh, we actually are having less greenhouse gas emissions than we are um, emitting. And that is true. However, as I mentioned earlier, targets, separate obligations for us uh, for greenhouse gas emission reduction and greenhouse gas emissions removals. So we can't say internationally that because of the fact that we have so many removals of emissions, we, we have a possibility and luxury to do nothing regarding climate change. That's not true. We have to do something. But, of course, it is very, very, very nice fact to know. Um, Yes, and now coming to the point why I think that we have to still do something and why it is important also here in Latvia uh, to speak about emissions reduction is the fact that if we look at our emissions of greenhouse gases per GDP, then Latvia is uh, having quite many emissions per GDP. Uh, that means that our, our production in some places is not as efficient as it could be and there is some possibility to reduce emissions. However, if you look at our GDP per capita, then we can see that uh, our emissions per capita are the lowest within EU, which means that for us, the emission reduction uh, financing is especially difficult issue, and here I think life can be very helpful. As regards targets that we have for greenhouse gas emission reduction, then um, I have to first mention that we have already determined targets for year 2020 and year 2050. For year 2020, uh, we have an uh, overall target within EU of minus 20% emission reduction, uh, which for Latvia is um, translated in a way that uh, we have minus 21% within a so-called emissions trading sector covered emissions and uh, plus 17% uh, within the rest of uh, emissions, uh, not covered by uh, this emissions trading system. Um, probably some of you will say that, well, nice, we have a uh, possibility to increase our emissions uh, by 2020, and we don't have to worry then about emission reductions. That's not quite true. Actually, our forecast shows that emissions of Latvia will increase more than this uh, plus 17 percent, and that means that we have to reduce emissions or we have to uh, develop our economy in the way that we are not adding more emissions to our economy. Uh, our prognosis shows that Latvia's emissions with no additional activities will increase by 2020 by 19%. As regards 2050, uh, there is overall target within EU that all emissions must be reduced by at least 80 to 95%, which is overwhelming target. That's a very major target. That means that we have to completely uh, con uh, completely, I'd say, change our economic uh, operations. We have to change our current way of operating uh, mostly with fossil energy resources to renewables and we have to implement a lot of uh, energy efficiency measures. And what is in the middle between these two um, targets, it is not yet known. Currently there are negotiations within EU about target for 2030 but 
let's wait and see. Probably the decision will be made in, in October of this year. Um, on top of these greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, there are also two additional targets for EU and also for Latvia that are supposed to help uh, to achieve this uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction target of EU. First, there's a target of uh, share of renewables. Um, it is determined that renewables energy share uh, within the total share of energy must be at least 20% by 2020, and energy efficiency must be improved at least by 20% uh, by 2020. So these are additional targets. As regards share of renewable energy uh, for Latvia, this target is actually um, translated even tougher. For Latvia, target is 40% uh, renewable energy share. We have already around 35% renewables. We have to increase it up to 40%, and that is definitely more um, challenging than in the rest of Europe. But as regards energy efficiency, the target for Latvia is the same, and um, assessing the situation that we have here in Latvia, we see that it is very challenging actually to, res to achieve this target. There is a very big demand for energy efficiency measures. However, there is a really very strong lack of financing within energy efficiency um, activities. And there is also probably some, some legal issues which uh, should be solved in order to mainstream energy efficiency measures and, 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 and really scale it up. And yes, I was already telling about the um, ambitions for Latvia regarding these greenhouse gas emission targets. And here you can see um, illustration of that. You can see our forecasts for 2020 as well as forecasts for 2030. And you can see that uh, currently they are a little bit above our emission target for 2020. And of course, for 2030, the target will be tougher and we definitely will be way beyond our target. And as regards 2050 for Latvia, 80 to 95% would mean that uh, current emissions sh should be reduced by, by more than a half. And that's, of course, a big challenge. Um, what else I should add regarding Latvia's emission profile, what is special about us? Uh, first, I have to mention that the total size of uh, Latvia's economy is very small in comparison to the rest of Europe, and therefore total amount of our emissions is also relatively small. If we build a new plant in Latvia, then it significantly changes our emissions. And also our development of economy has a very significant impact upon our emission profile. Um, I was already mentioning about EU ETS, so EU ETS Emission trading system is a special activity working on the EU scale, and it is supposed to be the main greenhouse gas emission reduction activity within EU. However, for Latvia, because of the fact that we have very few big uh, plants in Latvia, uh, the share of emissions covered by this activity is very small. And so we have to uh, invent and implement a lot of activities um, to reduce emission outside this um, emissions trading sector. And especially large emissions in Latvia are coming from transport and agriculture. Currently there are few, really very few um, measures to reduce emissions in transport and agriculture sector and EU has recognized that reducing of emissions in these sectors uh, is uh, actually the biggest challenge. And well, I think we have a good possibility here in Latvia to prove that it is possible and I hope again that LIFE program will be able to help us somehow to address these issues. Um, yes, I was already mentioning that very large share of our renewables uh, is already uh, used in, in, in Latvia and that our um, energy base is already rather green and that is also very specific about Latvia and uh, that is one of the reasons why any, remission, any reductions of emissions um, tend to be very uh, um, costly for us because when you reduce emissions, um, their costs are um, estimated per ton of emissions reductions. And as our base is very green, then costs are pretty high. And yes, I was mentioning already about the forests 
and so therefore we have very large removals of emissions. As regards climate change, um, thinking about adaptation, um, I have to note that warming generally is perceived as something positive. I don't know, probably you will also agree to the fact that it was very nice that this spring was very warm. Do you agree to that? Yes, so <laughs> typical examples of Latvians. And of course, the fact that climate change is uh, perceived as something positive, it is very difficult to explain to Latvian society the adverse effects of uh, climate change. Uh, and it is very difficult to explain to society that it is necessary to um, mitigate climate change and that it is necessary to adapt to climate change. Um, probably it is very important for, for Latvia society to learn that climate change doesn't mean simply warming of average temperature. It means more extreme weather events and a lot of other very, very, very bad impacts. But I, I, yes, today this is not, not, today that is not a topic of my presentation, so I will continue with, uh, with, with, with my presentation about what is special about Latvia. Um, then, uh, yes, it is very common that some part of climate change adverse impacts uh, are addressed by insurance companies. In Latvia, insurance, um, sector is very, very, very um, insufficiently developed as regards climate change impacts addressing. So this is one of the things we have to address. And then we have a long coastline. Major cities are on at our coastline. So we are affected by erosion of seasides, by floods caused by surges. Uh, there are limitations of sewage water system. Probably you have now noticed that sometimes in, in the cities we have very heavy rainfalls and then in a very short period of time uh, our city are, are flooded. At least some part of the streets or, or some part of the districts are flooded. So this is one of the problems we have and uh, it is very hard to solve it because uh, there are certain limitations for sewage water system. We are dependent on forest. And because of the fact that it is becoming uh, warmer, there are some species uh, which are now endangered. For example, I have also heard that our pine trees are not liking our climate so much as, as, as they used to before. So it's also a problem for us. And definitely one of the problems uh, that we have is vulnerability of agriculture. Um, Yes, it is becoming warmer and maybe to a certain extent it becomes easier to grow different, uh, different crops, but also the fact that we are having floods, that we are having droughts and very, very rapid changes of temperature, uh, that is causing problems as well. And now, as regards policy development, how far we are and what is now topical in that area, uh, we have just approved environmental policy guidelines for 2014, 2020. Uh, there you will be able to find uh, key priorities, key priorities regarding climate change development, as well as key measures that we are planning to implement. And based on these guidelines, we are currently uh, developing climate change mitigation program. Uh, for 2040-2020. Uh, we will see how it will go, but uh, our plan is that, these, um, that this program should be approved by the end of this year. And after that, we will work uh, on the development of low carbon development strategy for 2050. Uh, that will uh, show how Latvia uh, could uh, achieve this long-standing long target for 2050. In parallel to all of this, we of course are contributing towards development of EU climate policy regarding uh, 2030. Uh, we are currently actively participating in EU uh, negotiations and uh, we hope that Latvia will be able to achieve um, what is needed for, for Latvia regarding economic development and also environmental protection there. And yes, currently we are also working on the ratification of so-called Doha Amendment of Kyoto Protocol. Uh, as you know, the main document governing climate change protection internationally is Kyoto Protocol. And in Doha, um, member, not members, but parties to the Kyoto Protocol approved the second period of Kyoto Protocol to provide for a possibility to continue Kyoto Protocol after 2012. And uh, so Latvia, 
similarly as other countries have to ratify this uh, document now. And yes, at the end of this year, next year, we will also work on the strategy on the adaptation to climate change. Um, this will be very time consuming work because this is a new topic and it requires a lot of investigation, a lot of modeling, but I think the result will be very useful because there will be also uh, interactive tools that uh, will be uh, available to uh, every citizen of Latvia to see uh, what climate impacts and what climate adaptation measures it, he or she could implement uh, at its um, region. And now speaking about money, the money that has been available up to now to implement different climate initiatives. Uh, first uh, and, 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 and main uh, uh, source of funding in Latvia has been up to now climate change financial instrument. It started its operation in 2009 and up to now within this instrument we have approved more than 2,000 projects uh, within uh, 16 different tenders. Tenders are still ongoing and projects are still being approved, so this number will increase. Uh, but uh, as regards this fund in terms of money, then total uh, money, what has been allocated to this program was more than 200 million euros. And for Latvia's term, that has been quite a lot. Uh, the funds were used for financing uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction by the way of energy efficiency measures, as well as uh, by the way of uh, promoting switch from fossils to renewables, uh, so different technologies. And we were financing uh, particularly uh, municipalities, government institutions, uh, as well as households and, and, and enterprises. So basically everybody was eligible to receive financing either within one or other tender. Uh, we also financed uh, a very small projects for uh, research and development regarding emission reductions and public awareness raising. However, you all can see that the share of these projects was very small and definitely there are a lot of things that still could be done in this um, area. Other initiatives that we have here in Latvia regarding, uh, financing, regarding financing climate activities uh, firstly, of course, EU funding. Uh, from EU funds up to now, there was a possibility to receive uh, uh, money to finance energy efficiency measures within multi-apartment buildings. Uh, that will be also continued in the new uh, EU funding uh, period. And um, we will also have a possibility from EU funds to finance uh, electromobility. Uh, in past, uh, EU funds also financed use of biomass but we are not sure whether that will be still available in the new financing period. And then we have um, European and Economic Area Financial Mechanism. Uh, within this mechanism regarding climate change, currently uh, there are five million euros total financing available that is distributed between a small grant scheme, open calls for projects, and two capacity um, raising projects that will be implemented by the ministry. Uh, open calls and small grant scheme has been already announced and information on that can be found in our internet site. And then of course there are separate projects, uh, mostly on adaptation, however they are just um, international projects regarding uh, developing the, 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 the issue, developing strategies, developing some planning, but uh, there are no specific, Latvia specific projects regarding adaptation up to now. And we are definitely lacking some, some projects on the regional level. There are none projects uh, that has been implemented for municipalities regarding climate change, uh, mitigation planning or adaptation planning. Uh, except one municipality, I think, uh, Salas Grivi municipality, which has implemented project regarding development of adaptation strategy. So main challenges for Latvia. Uh, firstly, uh, long-term strategic planning. Uh, climate change is a really long, long-term event, and um, also investments in emission reduction uh, are long-term. Uh, planning requiring activities. So we have to think long term. And if we think long term, then we can definitely see some benefits of 
such investments and such activities. Of course, in short term, greenhouse gas emission reductions will increase the costs. However, in long term, that will reduce them because uh, if we also take into account the costs caused by climate change impacts, then definitely that is an advantage if we are tackling this. And then we have to change our attitude. Um, up to now, climate change in Latvia was treated as an area where everybody can get extra financing. And here I'm implying to a climate change financial instrument. Unfortunately, that is not anymore the case. Currently, a climate change area really needs a special attention and it needs uh, that we are uh, taking care of it, that we are implementing emission reduction measures and that we are implementing uh, adaptation measures. And actually, if we are investing wisely, then uh, these kind of measures can serve as an opportunity for us, as an opportunity to increase our international competitiveness, to increase our efficiency, uh, as an opportunity to optimize our costs. Uh, climate change activities are really very much about economy, so we have to be smart. And that's definitely not a burden if we are being wise. Uh, now, as regards financing, of course we need to raise more financing and we have to think about raising both public and private financing. And this event regarding the possibilities provided by LIFE is one of the possibilities we definitely have to use in Latvia. And as I mentioned earlier, of course, um, there will never be a situation that we have enough money for everything. So we have to be wise again and we have to identify the most optimal solutions. And if we once have identified the optimal solution, we have to multiply it and continue being uh, wise and implementing these very efficient uh, solutions also in future. And of course, I would like to see Latvia as a country that is developing and deploying uh, new technologies. From the ministry side, we have already financed two tenders for development of technologies, and we have developed really uh, new technologies regarding climate change mitigation that has become a competitive technologies in Latvia and now are trying to go internationally. And I really believe that it is possible also to continue uh, doing like this and it is possible to develop very good ideas here in Latvia because we have a good base for that. So these would be main challenges from my side and at the end of the presentation I would like to wish you all that we use as much energy as needed. If it happens so that you have a dragon at your home with three heads, you all know the tale that we have in Latvia, then if you need to, to, to fry a sausage, don't use all three heads. Maybe it's enough with only one head. And I think this is a nice allegory we can take away with us also in our daily life, really. Let's not waste our energy and use it just as much as needed and not a bit more. So that would be all from my side. Maybe there are some questions. I know that probably I have spoken too long, but maybe just a few questions. So it's not. Jūs minējāt pēdējā slaidā par kompānijām, kuras patreiz izmantojot Eiropas fondus attīstīs jaunus produktus vai jaunas tehnoloģijas, par kurām kompānijām jūs runājāt un varbūt jūs varat minēt kādu piemēru. So the question was about companies which has used EU funds and developed new technologies and now going internationally. Firstly, I have to mention that they were not EU funds that they used. They were these uh, funds from Climate Change Financial Instrument. And as regards maybe quoting a precise companies, I will do it bilaterally with you, but not make it publicly. But there are some, some related to, to solar panels and, and, and also to the uh, treatment of sewage water system. There are some examples. Thank you for the question. Some others maybe? Okay, if there is no questions, maybe we can start. Um, and thank you, Ilse, for introduction and uh, policy in Latvia. And we can start uh, information about life. That's the reason why we are all coming here today. And I will turn the video, and then Dorta will continue.
we need new technology, we need new policies. Uh, so that's going to be perhaps a very important area. The second important area is going to be uh, how to adapt to climate change. Because we see the effects of climate change already, we see the floods, we see the droughts. So we have to develop policies related to that. And the third area is how to communicate and raise awareness about climate change and how to reach the governance of climate change. And so we are going to uh, pay a lot of attention to communicating to the citizen. We hope to receive offers on good ideas from a variety of institutes and individuals. So they are all welcome to formulate their ideas on policy proposals. As Glenopold, we had a really big dream to change our problem to something positive. We have seed uh, company and we are cleaning lots of uh, uh, seed and grass seed and we get lots of waste. And that was the problem. What should we do with the, with the waste? By the BioAgro project, we were able to upgrade that waste into a new type of second generation agro pellet. And uh, this agro pellet uh, has uh, benefits for the project partners because they can now get rid of over 100 cubic meters of oil use per year just at, at this facility. And they are also now able to export pellets, sell it as a carbon neutral source. For us as a, as a small company here in Sweden, it was very interesting for us to apply for this funding due to we don't have any own development or research department. To fund a project like this is very hard for a small company as we are. È importante perché ha lanciato una nuova strategia eh, avendo combinato una, una partnership fra soggetti pubblici e soggetti privati. Eh, la finalità, l'obiettivo è quello di eh, arrivare a incrementare il numero degli alberi in città attraverso interventi di forestazione urbana. Abbiamo realizzato un toolkit con il quale possono calcolare le loro emissioni di CO2 e calcolare la loro impronta di carbonio e decidere quanti alberi piantare con il progetto. Gaia è stata una straordinaria opportunità per noi per testare un una nuova esperienza di partnership pubblico privato in cui le nostre imprese e soci hanno dovuto imparare a mediare i loro obiettivi imprenditoriali con degli obiettivi di natura pubblica per il bene comune del territorio nel quale si collocano e nel quale sono nate e si sviluppano. Abbiamo potuto studiare diverse specie che sono comuni nella nostra città e caratterizzarle dal punto di vista ecofisiologico. Così abbiamo appunto caratterizzato le specie che assorbono più CO2. In questo modo possiamo combattere i cambiamenti climatici e migliorare anche la qualità della vita delle persone. Through the LIFE program, and in particular the part on climate change, we want to create incentives. Incentives that reward people with good ideas either in the private sector or in the public sector. There is a lot to be thought through. There is a lot that can be done. And building on the creativity of people is really what we are hoping for. So here, uh, the video that was uh, made by the, I think by your company actually, uh, together with uh, the Director General for Climate Action, uh, and you actually saw the Director General of that Director General, General um, talking to you. Um, I'm going to talk about something a bit drier, not quite as fancy, not quite as many people talking, just me. Um, and actually I'm going to give you a general introduction if this will all work fine if not I will call for Sophia but it looks okay there we go so as I said before I work in the life nature unit so uh, that's the director general environment 
course, we collaborate closely and collaborated closely on the whole life program. And I will um, guide you through uh, several aspects. Oops. This is not the way it should be. There we go. So first of all, I'll talk a bit about the policy context. So you know where life is in all this European far away world. Uh, something about the structure, especially the legal structure. Some commonalities between the two life sub-programs, the sub-program for environment and the sub-program for climate action. Uh, and then some specificities of the sub-program for environment. And some basic information on the calls for proposals. Actually, later on I will talk more about specificities. So, why life, uh, the comparison of life, how it was? Uh, has any one of you already had a life project, is having a life project, knows about life? Please raise the hand. None. Yes, one, two, okay, three, four. Uh, I hope I won't bore you. If not, you have permission to, to drop out for a moment and come back when I talk about the new things. Um, then I'll talk about the new elements, new priorities, stronger emphases, etc. So why life? Well, life actually is the only purely to environment, uh, only instrument purely dedicated to environment and climate change um, in, uh, the, among the European uh, instruments. It's a catalyst. It's a relatively small program. And the idea is to do something locally or together with other partners across borders, but mainly do something that can be replicated and transferred to others. So that um, is something that multiplies after the project. And that's why it's also important that the project do something sustainable, that's something that can live on when there is no longer any life funding. It's an ideal instrument to show authorities and also companies how you can invest in the environmental sector and uh, develop strategic um, plans for implementing environmental policy. And it actually is quite an old instrument. It's been around for more than 20 years and very successfully so. So, as I said, it already has been around a lot, a long time. It was focusing on three areas up to now. The nature and biodiversity area, the environment area, what we call the environment area, that included actually climate action, and the information area. Now, as of 2014 and for the next seven years, as you know, the, the European cycle is the seven-year cycle, um, for the next seven years, there are two sub-programs. One is called For Environment, and actually it is a, a program that covers the former life areas. And the climate action has been taken out and given a special sub-program, which will address then the different sectors under uh, climate action, as we already mentioned in the video. So what remains, because all for people who've been around for a long time, it often is nice to know what remains, what is, what's the same. So, as I said, the same priorities as they used to be under the old Life Plus program. Some of the project types, we used to have what we called innovative projects. Now they're called pilot, but it's actually the same thing. Demonstrative projects, best practice projects and information projects, or let's say the information component of information projects, because there are some new things. These projects we call traditional projects. And they actually also exist for the new strand, for the new sub-program for the climate action. Then there are some funding types that we will recognize. We have the action grants. I looked that up because it's quite important to, to understand the differences between different grants. The Weichschmu dotatios, and then there are the operating grants, the Weichschloss dotatios. Um, so one is for actions, and the other one is for 
keeping things going. What I will be talking about today mainly is going to be the Weichsmo dotatios because uh, those are the ones um, that you probably came here for. Uh, that's the action grants, that's the projects, different types of projects. And I will also talk about something new that I'll touch on later. Um, if you have any questions on the other uh, types, so if you're an NGO, for example, and you're interested in that, you can come up to me during the lunch break. What is also the same is the exceptionally high uh, funding rate for a specific type of projects. It's nature projects that are dedicated to priority species under the habitats and birds directives, hub, uh, so priority species or priority habitats uh, that are part of Natura 2000. The actors remain the same. We are glad to welcome back uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, um, NGOs, public authorities, so actually just about everybody. And the application for the traditional project, the application tool, which we are kind of proud of actually, uh, also will remain the e-proposal tool, which I will introduce in the more detailed part later on. What are the new elements? Well, there are many. First of all, we have more of a framework. We are trying to do a bit more top-down, not really, but we're not forcing you. We don't want to hamper your creativity completely, but should we give a framework, uh, and we call those multi-annual work programs. The first one has been adopted in March and is uh, now uh, also available in Latvian. That's actually where I got all my words from. And um, also, um, there is a change in the geographical scope. Exceptionally, it will be possible to do actions outside the Union, and that may be interesting in some, some areas. I will come to that later. Uh, there are also some new actors. Uh, there is the Executive Agent Agency for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, IASME, who will actually take over the management and then, as of 2015, also entirely the evaluation of the traditional projects and some other project types, uh, only the integrated projects and the technical system projects and the preparatory projects will be staying with the commission. There are also banks in there because now we have financial instruments. So the EIB, the European Investment Bank, steps in as an actor and also intermediary banks and the national contact points, they always existed, but they have a bit of a different role now than they had before. They actually mentioned for the first time explicitly in the regulation, so they have a special consultative and counseling role and guidance role and um, will help you along the way through this jungle of, of which I will describe. And the funding types, I mentioned it, there are new funding, there's a new funding type, the innovative financial instruments a bit like the uh, financial instruments that was introduced by Ilse. The priorities I mentioned before, climate change is a new separate priority. It already existed as part of environment, but now it's a separate entity. The governance component, which means we focus more not only on information, but also making sure that EU policy is really implemented, not just on paper. Um, there are new, there's a focus that is stronger, especially in the sub for environment. Uh, we have now what we call thematic priorities. There's a whole annex with them. And further below that, there are the so-called project topics. Projectu temas, something like that. Um, then there are national allocations still, but they are going away. So there are only national allocations for the sub-program for environment, no longer for uh, any other project types uh, under the climate, uh, no, uh, not at all for um, projects, uh, like integrated projects, so only the traditional projects and some, some other project types. And it's a four-year envelope. It used to be per year, we told every country, more or less, this is the amount you can expect for projects from your country, and it would block uh, the lists, etc. Uh, this is uh, going to be going uh, 
away actually as of 2018, there will no longer be any national locations. So then Latvia is free to take it all. There's a stronger emphasis on complementarity. Before we were a bit afraid because, you know, it's always we are a nice little program and then we were a bit afraid that there would be the risk of double funding and it wouldn't be able to, to see that actually we need to have complementarity with other programs, also with other EU programs. And so uh, that is now something that we actually want to emphasize on. We want more, more uh, multi-purpose design, so not focus on just one area, but multi-purpose. As I've mentioned before, replication and transfer is and will be very important, even more important. What is also very important, we've been doing great things for the last 20 years, but then at some point we realized we haven't really been keeping track that well or in, in an organized way so that we can show to the world, or to Europe at least, what we've been doing. So we need to have more information about what has been done for what part of, uh, of the environment in Europe and what part of climate uh, change or climate action has been addressed. The long-term sustainability and the green procurement also are elements that used to be partially around there, but now they are generally important. New tools, you already heard there were new project type names around. For those who don't know life, it's not new, but well, there are that many, uh, and uh, I will explain them a little bit more in detail later on. Innovative financial instruments and funding rates. Funding rates used to be 50%, except for those very high priority area, uh, priority species, 75%. Um, now it's 60% which is nice, of course, for the beneficiaries. So 60% funding coming from us, 40% funding coming from you or partly from your co-financers. But however, it means also that, of course, the amount of money is divided between less. So, you know, it, it increases competition logically. Um, and then there are capacity building projects which concern some member states who fulfill specific criteria and they actually get 100% of the eligible costs. So, legal structure. Um, as I said before, we would try to have a bit more of a focused approach. Um, the, there are three priority areas under each sub-program. So you have the two sub-programs. Under each sub-program, you have three priority areas. Um, environment resource efficiency, nature, and biodiversity. I'm sorry, I, I'm moving away the microphone, I just noticed. Um, and environment, governance, and information. For climate change, you have climate change, governance, and information. And you have climate change adaptation and mitigation. Again, the structure. All these slides I was told would be on the website later on. I will have to check some spelling mistakes. I might have slipped in there or double entries. Um, and then uh, you will be able to relook at them. Uh, this is the legal framework. I will not go into details all that. You can really look up at your ease. There are many, many elements that you would maybe want to look into. <coughs> So, what are the objectives? The objectives are, it's not difficult to understand that from already the sub-program for environment and resource efficiency, it's resource efficient, low carbon, climate resilient, economy, and we want to do lots for biodiversity, especially in Natura 2000. By the way, who of you knows what Natura 2000 is? Hmm? Well, two, three, my goodness. Okay, the Tour 2000 is the network of protected areas in Europe. And I just make a little promo here, being a nature person. Um, and uh, it connects, actually, it's meant to be a, a network of protected areas across all of Europe, protecting both habitats and species. Well, uh, improving the implementation and the development and the enforcement of uh, union law. 
in the field of environmental climate ac uh, action, of course. Integrating and mainstreaming the objectives into other union policies. Now, this has always been our objective. We always wanted to be part of it. The environment and climate uh, is, there are, by definition, problems or issues that touch every other area, agriculture, uh, infrastructure, um, fisheries, you name it, it's all connected. Um, to do this a bit better, uh, we have invented these integrated projects, which I will talk to in more detail later on, where they, we try to integrate the mainstream, actually, environment and climate issues more strongly. Governance, I already mentioned, and then there's the seventh environmental action program, which, of course, is our program, again, for the next seven years. The budget. Uh, this uh, is the overall budget for 2014-2020. What might be more interesting to you is what's in the pot for 2014, because that's the pot uh, you will be competing in or, yes, in with others. So projects funded by action grants, so that was the Veiksmu Dotsios, I think, um, they are the ones, they are, it's quite a big amount, right? But you have to see that they're subdivided. So in the sub-program for environment, we are at 250 million, more or less, out of which 165 million will be for traditional projects. Traditional projects being the ones that I mentioned at the beginning. So pilot, demonstration, uh, best practice and information governance. <coughs> then there is 55% of these in, under the subprogram environment are for nature and biodiversity. Actually, because in the Habitats Directive, there is a clear indication that the Commission, the Union, has to support this in particular. So it has a big weight in this, in this whole program. To give you also an idea about the relationship between environment and climate under the whole program, the environment part is 75%, the climate program is 25%. Then there are 61 million for the so-called integrated projects. This year there'll only be integrated projects under the subprogram for environment. The climate will start with that next year. And operating grants. Uh, this year, 9 million. So, some common features. I said it before, the same stakeholders, the same geographical scope, the same emphasis on replicability, the same nots. That means the same things we are not. We are not research, neither under climate nor under environment. We are innovative or demonstrative or best practice or information and governance or integration. So that means we don't focus on that. There can be small necessary research parts that are well argued, but we are not there for university research. We're not there for large infrastructure. That's for structural funds. We're not there for um, you know, big rural regional development. That's again for structural funds. And we have the same support and monitoring. Uh, for those of you who have had or are, in the, are now in life projects, involved in life projects, um, we've been always very close to our project, actually, uh, supported by monitoring teams, and we've been following the projects, visiting them, for example, once in their lifetime. In the future, that will be done by the external um, agency, executive agency. So, I believe that the geographical scope, I could talk about that for a long time. I will skip it here. If you have questions, if you have a project idea, and I'll just give you an idea of what could be issues which could be under, fall under this. So it would be cross-border, for example, river management with a country outside the EU. Um, it could be management of alien species that come in from uh, outside the EU or air pollution that comes where the source is outside the use of actions, where actually it's, or um, 
issues which are outside the EU, but that affect your country, and so in this case, Latvia, um, in a way that you cannot do anything about it except if you do it at the source. And so you have to collaborate with someone outside the EU to do that. Well, some words about the new actor, Yasma, I said so, uh, before. It's, it's one of the executive agency. Executive agency, it's a bit like, some member states have that as well. It's like an agency working for a ministry or working for a, uh, another public authority doing the um, management of programs or you know, managing uh, projects or whatever. And that's what's going to happen as of this year. This slide, I don't know how to take this out that it comes in and flies in like that, but anyway. <laughs> it won't do that on the, on the website, so don't worry. Um, as of when, sorry, that's maybe one question you might have. I said as of this year, but actually the selection procedure will still be started by the commission, simply because we had so little time to prepare everything. Uh, so we will start the selection procedure and we'll be supported by YASMA and then later in the process, in the revision phase, there will be the other round, other way around. EASMA will be leading, and we will be supporting EASMA. So it's a it's a hand-in-hand -hand process to the best of the future beneficiaries and the applicants, the now applicants. And so now something about the SEP program for environment. I didn't look at the clock. I don't know how I'm in the timing. You please uh, indicate if I'm uh, running very late. Um, the three priority areas and their common goals. So the three priority areas, I mentioned it before, and I'm repeating it because repetition, they say, is something that makes you remind, remember things. Environment and resource efficiency, we call it ENF. So when you, later on I will be talking about ENF and NET and G. So these are the abbreviations we gave them. These are the abbreviations you will find again when you use e-proposal, for example. So there will be something that will accompany this program for the next seven years and um, kind of help you find your place in this, in this whole program. So the ENF is environment and resource efficiency. NAT is nature and biodiversity. Environment, governance, and information is G. For climate, there would be the CCM, so climate change mitigation, CCA, climate change adaptation, and JIC, no? governance and information for climate. Uh, so these are the abbreviations you will be seeing a lot. Common goals. Do we have the specific objectives, which are in the regulation? Then under that, under that we have the thematic priorities. And under that, we have the project topics. The thematic priorities are in the regulation. The project topics are in the multi-annual work program. And that was the reason why um, I insisted that this be translated in all the languages, because I think it's very, 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 very important um, that everyone can read in their own language, hopefully well translated, um, what are the top priorities for us for the next four years. For us, I mean the commission and the member states, because we can discuss this with the member states. It's a long list, so don't worry. There are many, many possibilities. And not falling under one of these priority, of these project topics, does not mean that you're excluded. It just means, just means, that you will get less points in award. So it will lower your chances if you're not an excellent project. But it does not exclude excellent projects. And falling under a project topic does not mean that you will pass in any case because you still have to be an excellent project to be able to even get to the stage of getting additional points. This I will explain a bit more. Um, and we have also the targets which are defined uh, in more detail in the multi annual work program. I come to that because it's really important that when you think about choosing life or not choosing life, you should be aware of the framework, what it's for, what, what are the things we're looking for. 
Oop. That was... Uh, Okay, so here are the thematic priorities for environment. These are the thematic priorities for nature, nature and biodiversity, and the tools, the tools, I mean the traditional projects. So what happens if you fall under a project topic? You get the full bonus, which means 10 extra points. Um, what kind of project do you have to have? You have to have a best practice project or a pilot or demonstration project. It has to be a project that addresses the well, habitat or the birds directive or the biodiversity strategy. Uh, and under the nature sub-program, we also, of course, have the integrated projects, but I will describe those later in more detail, so I'll skip that. Um, the thematic priorities under governance and information. So, I said before, information we've always had, but now it's governance, and governance is really important because it, it makes things that are on paper enter into force really on the ground. So, for example, uh, support of uh, cooperation networks, etc. All the, the details are described in the project topics. To come back just a moment for the thematic priorities, why did I not put any more details on this? Because, as you can see, there are many. Um, and you best, if you fall into one of those areas, go to the project topics in the multi annual work program and just look whether that type of idea could be addressed or is addressed by your project idea. So, I come to the basic information on calls for proposal for 2014. There will be a joint publication for both sub-programs. We are hoping, we're keeping our fingers crossed that this will happen on the 16th of June. Um, as always in these last minute runner up things, we are a bit late. There are many, many people working together on these. Many people have to be consulted. And of course, we want also e proposal to work really without any problem. So these project uh, proposal preparation will not be a nightmare, but something, well, not pleasant, but, but still. Uh, it will be a help, helpful tool and not uh, break down every few minutes, etc. So we have to do, of course, adaptations and we have to rely on many people to do so. So 16th of uh, June is uh, our big hope. It might not uh, be that day, it might be a few days later. But uh, under one publication, there are separate calls. And the Calls are separated per project type and priority area. And um, this is uh, just to give you an idea how this will be then. So the joint call for action grants, for capacity building uh, projects, for so there will be no differentiation between climate and uh, environment. Capacity building doesn't make sense to make a difference. It's, it's actually for countries to build up their capacity to attract more life projects. So this is, you know, increase the uptake of life projects in, in a given country. So it doesn't make sense to separate that. Then operating grants, um, I mentioned these are for the nonprofit organizations. Also joint, it doesn't really make sense to make a call for climate, non-governmental or non-profit organizations. Uh, it's most address environment and climate and, you know, wouldn't make much sense. While there will be separate calls for uh, action grants, the so-called traditional ones, sub-program environment, integrated, technical assistance and preparatory projects, and for climate only, only the traditional, only traditional meaning already four types of projects, so it's already quite a bit. Um, it looks to me that this information is repeated. 
And here we go with the indicative timetable. So publication, you see it says June, it doesn't say 16th. But well, we really would like it to be the 16th because we also would like to give you the necessary time to prepare until then the 16th of October, you know, to prepare the, the proposals, introduce them in the system, and, and, and etc. Uh, so then submission in October, grants hopefully signed in July. I'll explain later why it takes that long, you will, you will see. It's a very intense period. Um, then preparation of the reserve list and in parallel, so these are traditional projects and the preparatory uh, and the um, technical assistance and in parallel the integrated projects. So thank you for your attention. Any questions? Hmm? Either I make you sleep or <laughs> I completely scare you away or that you can also maybe ask in Latvian, sorry, uh, so then you can translate, I don't know, is that possible? Yes, we can do that too. To make it easier? Okay, maybe there will be questions later and we can give the floor to the James. Good morning, everybody. It's nearly time for coffee. I shall try and be short and sharp, because I'm sure the coffee is now starting to feel very tempting. Um, I'm trying to... Pardon? Sorry, louder. I'm trying to wake the people up at the back. It's okay. Um, just a bit of audience participation, just to get us in the mood. If you're not here with any real experience of life, can I ask how many here have actually are in the public sector and responsible for climate change policies? Nobody? Nobody here from a public sector institution with responsibility for climate change? Have you come to the right meeting? <laughs> How many people out here are from business? Ah, oh, now we see the audience, okay. So how many in the business world have any familiarity with life? No. Okay. So now we know where we start. We, where the starting point is. So, who, if they're not in a business, are you from an NGO? Who are from the NGOs? So we've got a few NGOs, but nobody from government. One, one government, two government, three. Nobody else. Four. I still don't think that counts for 100 percent. Shout out who you're from. If I haven't covered you as an NGO, or from business, or from government. Pardon? 
I mean, municipal I mean, by government, I mean municipalities. Sorry. All right, who's from a municipality then? Ah, so we've got a few more. Okay, have I missed anybody else out? The cameraman, yeah, he's, he's not from any of these. Okay, so, so actually we've got a rather interesting mix of people here. Some know life, but don't know climate change. Some know climate policy, but don't know life. We have businesses who don't know anything about European programs so far, but have an interest in investing in climate change. Um, so I, I think probably a lot of this morning, for some people, would have been very interesting, but for a lot of people, over the top, all this government stuff. So I'm going to try and bring it down to the lowest common denominator. And if I'm too basic, you have to ask questions, OK? Now, and I suspect one of the reasons you've not been asking questions is that a lot of the information is perhaps assuming too much about your background knowledge of life. You don't really need to know an awful lot about the background to life. Hello. Can you speak to the mic? Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I'll try and, be, try and bring it down a little bit to, 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 to basics. Um, so just to repeat a little bit. So the starting point is this is a grant-funded program. It will give you 60% of the costs of your project as long as your project in this part of the life sub-program addresses climate change mitigation or climate change adaptation or probably not that many people in the room but for the NGOs perhaps to do with governance and communication. Okay? So the starting point is it's a grant funded project. There's a call each year. You put in your bid. The national contact point is here to help uh, give you guidance as to where you get your projects and to, to give you some shape. Um, the principal concern is that we're not after research projects. So what Daughter was saying about what the knots are are really important. Because if you spend time trying to come up with interesting research projects, so if you're in business and you want money for R&D, this is not the program for R&D. Um, if you want uh, to do something with structural fund money, then go to the structural fund programs. Don't come to life. The complication is that some of the integrated projects will want you to be looking at structural funds, but we'll come on to that later. But essentially, it's a rather basic grant-funded project for anybody that's interested but can meet these objectives. Okay? Um, and Dorothy mentioned one document, and I urge... I don't urge you to, very often to read commission documents, but on the website of the commission is the, the MOL, the Multi-Annual Work Programme. Okay? As a commission document, it's not too bad. Okay? It is not full of jargon. It is not overly full of legal cross-referencing and gives you as much a, a clearer description of the program as you're probably going to get in the slides. And you can read it at your leisure. It will be in your national language and it will probably cover a lot of the detail which probably you're struggling to really get to grips with. Um, you are in competition, okay? So I am giving this presentation in five other countries. There are 28 other countries that take money out of life. If you're really interested in life, you've got to be prepared to be disappointed because you may think it's great, but it has to go through a selection process, an appraisal process, a point scoring process, uh, and many life projects, are bids are disappointed. I think one in three projects gets funded. So again, You've got to be committed to the project. You've got to think it's good. You've got to test with a national contact point that you've got something that's really interesting and there's potential to be funded. Okay? So don't forget this is a competition. Don't forget about the overall sums of money. In a sense, at the project level, they're irrelevant. Uh, if your project is good, you'll get the money. Um, so just a little bit more detail on the mitigation. So you've got to demonstrate that the project will deliver reductions in emissions. Absolutely bottom line. Um, the expectation is you're not doing this as an R&D project. You're doing it through changing behavior. So you're targeting sectors. You may be looking at transport. You may be looking at energy. You may be looking at industry. You may be looking at agriculture. The idea is to be thinking about changing behavior that leads to reductions in emissions. 
So you, your good projects will have probably a number of different partners. Your project will probably be in, in a sector or have a sectoral context. Um, and there's no limitation particularly on what those sectoral contexts are. As long as you can see that you're changing behavior in order to reduce emissions rather than just as a technological fix, okay? We're not interested in technical fixes. There's a Horizon 2020 program that will fix, which will address that point. We're looking, if there are non-technical barriers to the take of interesting innovations and technologies, then life is the place you might want to look. Um, they are small scale. This money is not great. Um, I can't remember what the typical size of a project door to. Can you remind me? One million? A million euros? Typical project is uh, around a million to two million, yeah. yeah. But so, they are smaller ones, huh? especially governance information can be smaller. Yeah. But you, you, you're probably looking at something like a million euros. So you, basically your starting point is that if you're providing 40% match funding, you've got to be looking at, I don't know, 400,000 euros, just as a starting point, just as a finger in the air job. So again, as you say, some smaller projects will get through, but you you need some critical mass. More of, compared to previous programs, there will be more weight in the scoring that projects can deliver something that's replicable, which what in the jargon is called EU added value. In other words, does it last? Can other people do it? So in order to do that, you're probably going to have to have a reasonable sized project to have critical mass and scale. Um, but we're not looking at huge 10 million euro projects. Uh, that's integrated projects. But for the mainstream uh, program of projects, um, let's say one to two million is a sort of benchmark uh, figure in total. So you're finding 40% of that cost. There are, it's a bit complicated, they have taken some of the money which would normally have gone into projects and giving it to the European Investment Bank. Now I know some member states were rather unhappy at this, um, but it does mean there's a different stream of income that you can tap into because the European Investment Bank will be recruiting local banks across the different member states to provide loan money to projects which you guys can come up with. They will give you, well, it'll be negotiated. It'll be on a project-by-project -project basis, but they are, the, the banks will have some subsidy to, reduce, to take on higher risk projects. So if, if businesses, for instance, thought that the banks would not lend to this type of project, if they have an energy efficiency project in mind, Using the financial instrument with the IAB support, that may be an opportunity rather than a project. It may be that you want to get a loan rather than go through the process of getting a project fund financed. So particularly for the businesses in the room, I think the financial instrument has a particularly, should have some strong interest, uh, as long as it's around energy efficiency. Um, and then the final sector, and I, particularly taken by the initial presentation, that given the nature of the country and the reliance on agriculture and, and land use change in rural areas, this particular program, you'll see it in the multi-annual work program, gives particular weight to trying to support the EU policy called LULUCF, which most of you probably never heard of. It stands for land use, land use change and forestry. Essentially, it is the European policy directed to reducing emissions um, in rural areas linked to agriculture and forestry through land use change, through the better management of land, through better um, practices in agriculture and forestry. And that's got particular weight because it's, it's relatively new, it gets relatively overlooked in other European policies, so they see life as an opportunity to give greater weight and profile to that particular European policy. Okay, I'll, I'm going to miss out some of these, given the, the time. Um, these will be on the website. Um, but essentially, I'm, it will be repeating in slightly more detail what I've just said about where the priorities are. Um, climate change adaptation. Uh, this is the second of the three priorities. Um, again, this is new um, for the Commission. So you will be breaking new ground with um, your applications. So there will be some negotiation, I'm sure, with the Commission. But you're in a good place. You've got a national adaptation strategy in place. You've got good transnational policy frameworks 
from this morning's presentation, these Baltic-related uh, strategies. They give you a framework, a strong framework, I would have thought, for convincing projects designed to improve climate resilience. And again, there's no real limitation on the type of project. It could be linked to any of the climate threats, droughts, floods, um, extreme weather events, anything that you feel that um, uh, the, the adaptation strategy would give weight to, which would give added value to you when you put in your project. Um, the uh, financial instrument that's relevant here is something called the Natural Capital Financing Facility. Again, we'll have more of this this afternoon. But essentially, to the extent to which your adaptation measures and projects relate to ecosystems and ecosystem services, this is an opportunity, a potential opportunity to get uh, fun funding through the, through the instrument rather than through grant-funded projects. Um, and the other emphasis, whereas in mitigation, the emphasis on uh, rural areas and land use change in adaptation, the focus is more on cities um, and an urban focus. That's a European one. It may be that in Latvia, the big cities aren't the principal um, air location for, for climate threats. I don't, I don't know. And then, the, the, again, some more detail on where the priorities are. Um, largely to do with different types of threat and different types of geography. Um, we'll put these on the website and you can look at them. Again, they're, they're, they're elaborated in the annual work program. Um, and then we have the third priority, which is governance and information. And as Dorothy has been saying, this is really for those people who are perhaps in the NGOs who are particularly interested in raising awareness, improving engagement in these projects, um, and, and the policies of climate change. Uh, again, something perhaps for municipalities, if they want to develop some relationship with their citizens around climate change, uh, some particular communication program, some policy they want to promote, uh, this, this, this is an opportunity to get it funded. Okay, now you've heard a lot about different sorts of projects. I would re-emphasize that there's a lot of complexity which you can ignore, okay? Uh, I can say this because I'm not actually employed by the commission. Let the national contact point worry about the complexity. I'm sorry to put the burden on you. Um, the principal thing is, have you got a fundable project? It would be probably be what we would, what the commission conventionally calls a traditional project. Um, you put in an application. Um, as Doughty was saying, we're looking for pilot projects, so good ideas you want a pilot. Um, something you want to demonstrate that or, or you want to take up a scale, scaling up a good idea, or in the context of the third priority, something you want to replicate or promote or disseminate. The integrated project will come on to this afternoon, but essentially it's a big thing, probably for the, for the national government rather than for municipalities. Um, 10 million euros, uh, looking to integrate with other European programs and or national policies and programs. Um, technical assistance is there to help with the integrated project. Capacity building projects are for member states. Does Latvia qualify for capacity building funds? Do you know? Have you looked at the criteria? Maybe. Okay. There's some, some doubt. But possibly Latvia, will, the, the, the ministry in Latvia and the national contact point may be in a position to get 100% funding to, to, to support Sophia, who seems to be on her own. So she probably needs a lot of help to, to, to uh, administer the program. Um, so, questions and answers. I'm hoping you've got some more questions because I have tried to avoid a lot of some of the detail. I mean, perhaps we can start with people who actually have an idea and a project in their minds, just to illustrate what people sitting in the room are actually hoping to do. Please. Thank you. I have one project idea, but I'm not sure does it fit with these requirements. And if more concrete, uh, as you know, uh, in order to decrease emissions from ships, from shipping activities, uh, there is uh, IMO standards and, and uh, 
and, uh, requirements from Commission to use lower sulfur con content in f uh, maritime fuel and uh, to use a possibility to feed ships in the ports with electricity in order to stop the engine. And my question is, does the project uh, to build up uh, electricity connection to the pier for feeding the ship, which is uh, very high prices, and, and we estimated that total port it could be some 70 million, for some terminal it could be some 15 million euros. Does it fit with uh, these requirements concerning climate changes? Hello? Yeah, I don't want to be too definitive, but it sounds to me, like, as you've described it, much like an infrastructure project, just putting in a piece of kit. I think you'd be better off looking at the structural funds rather than the life program. I mean, life is about changing behavior. I mean, if all you're doing is allowing a ship to come in and plug into something, you're not really changing the shipping patterns, you're not really changing the behavior of the ships. Um, so, I would have said that was probably a better bet to, to look at the structural fund. If it's to do with changing the way in which the, the shipping itself is conducted, if it's to do with the way in which the ports operate, if it's to do with the management of the, of the port vis-a-vis -vis the boats, then that's potentially something more interesting to life. You know, in other words, where you're trying to engage people, you're trying to change patterns of behavior, um, then it becomes a life project. But if it's just to put a investing in a substation on a key or something, then I think that's, uh, that's more a structural fund project. But we can, have lunch, we'll have, we'll have, we can discuss it in more detail over a coffee. Okay, somebody at the back. Uh, in previous life program, anyway. <laughs> in previous life program, there was two main keywords. It's innovation and demonstration. Is it continuing this program? The whole projects will be innovative, yep. and it's in Europe scale, or maybe in Latvian scale. It's it's def definitely innovation, and it's definitely demonstration, and it's definitely part of thing. Uh, so they, they, those fundamentals stay the same. It can be, and would be expected to be at the Latvian scale. But there is, if you read the annual work program and the criteria you have to meet for money you have to demonstrate EU added value, okay? EU added value is essentially being able to either replicate something, so somebody else in Europe can take the Latvian example and perhaps do something with it, um, or you, it, it's, it, it's not just a single measure in Latvia, it's actually it's synergistic. In other words, it, it has a particularly strong impact across a number of policy areas in Latvia. So you're looking for replicability and transferability uh, and synergy. Okay? Those are the three key words you need in your bid to the funds, together with innovation, <laughs> piloting, and demonstration. Not research. Okay? Life always had a slight difficulty. They often get a lot of bids to do basic research and development. This is not the place you need to go to Horizon 2020. Sorry, if I could add something. Uh, on the innovation and demonstration. Um, yes, we still have the innovation and demonstration. That's one of the strongholds of the resource efficiency environment program, which require actually that a project is either innovative, so it's called pilot now, but it's the same, or demonstrative. And yes, it's enough if it is, so to say, locally demonstrative. Just for the differentiation, Innovative or pilot means it's new, um, it's just not been tested or applied before at all. I mean, it has been tested maybe in a laboratory, but not as a means and, uh, to, to replace best practice that exists. Demonstrative is something that has been maybe tested before, but it has not really been demonstrated on the ground. And there we make a differentiation. It can be just 
locally or in the context, so maybe the Latvian context, maybe it's never been done in Latvian context, maybe it's never been done in the climatic situation, or maybe it's never been done in the geographical, geographical situation. That's demonstrative. However, I mentioned before that there is something new under the LIFE program, and only under the LIFE sub-program for environment, the project topics, and they only apply for the sub-program for environment. And there, it is necessary to get the full points, there are actually 10 points that you can get, that under resource efficiency and environment, so the one with innovative and pilot projects, it is important and that you fall under a project topic and you get five points already. If you are on top of that, innovative or you are demonstrative EU-wide, so not only in Latvia, not only in the climatic situation, etc., you get a full 10 points. So just, and it's a specificity for that priority area. It's a specificity for the area, environment and resource efficiency, the area that used to be called an Alive Plus, uh, just environment. If I remember correctly, so just you know the the project. We, I will t uh, try. I will show some examples of projects later on <clears throat> for uh, the many people who don't haven't experienced live projects before, and I think it's always better to see it with an example. But uh, just to add to what you said, because under the climate um, action sub program. There, this does not exist. There are no thematic priorities, and so there are no project topics that give you extra points. It's a, it's a different system. Also, that I will show later on, it's better to understand that, looking at the criteria and comparing that. I think it's just easier to understand than, you know, in a, in a general way, but just to make sure that there are some, there are many, many things in common. That's, I tried to, to show that, but there are also some things that are quite different um, and be between the two programs. Thank you. Okay, can I just add a further point? I mean, this is not quite often the projects that come forward are, are about some form of technical solution. The innovation can be around the way in which different actors interact. So it can be about putting in new governance systems. It can be about putting in new strategies and relationships between different actors involved. So it's not just don't just think about te technology. The innovation can be about people and the way in which they relate to each other in delivering climate policy and climate strategies. Pardon? Because there's another program. Not live. Horizon 2020. It's basically for R&D and technology. Yeah. Also, I would like to add... Um, because there is a bit of a, it, it's this borderline between the two, right? And um, th there will be a dedicated document actually that we will be putting on the website. That will be part of our application package where we say, you know, when it is rather Horizon 2020, when is it rather life? I mean, it, in any case, it has to be environment. But under Horizon 2020, there is a sub program which also has even innovative and demonstrative projects. Uh, it already is running. Um, now, a general remark to that, that can also be seen positive. We have different ways of approaching environmental project, uh, programs and problems, right? And one is more the research and one is more uh, environment. And there are some differences between the two programs. And then it will be up to the beneficiary to decide, am I rather Horizon 2020 or am I rather life? And it can well be that they will apply for both because they have doubts about whether they better fit the one or the other, and then it will be the commission or the executive agency who will be saying, okay, no, you fit better this or that. So uh, it's not really such a big problem. I have a question regarding private finance for energy efficiency. What does it mean? Can you explain? OK, 
Okay. Yeah. Basically, there is a pot of money which taken out of the program and given to the European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank, with the support of the money from the program, will be used to encourage private banks to lend money to energy efficiency projects which they would otherwise not have funded because the risk was too high. And the money from the program is going to subsidize, if you like, that risk. So it makes it a viable proposition for the private sector to lend. The main proviso is that those um, uh, projects that are seeking mo loan money from the banks um, ought to be seen, we still have the same sorts of criteria of EU added value. We still want projects which can be demonstrating um, something new, can be sent that can be replicable, and probably, more importantly, is part of the national strategy for energy efficiency and the national energy efficiency action plan. And if the, if the application for loan funding can particularly sit within the national plan, it will get extra points because it will demonstrate that strategic approach. And I think for energy efficiency projects, um, and particularly for businesses, um, I suspect the finance initiative will be a particularly, it's a new innovation, we're not quite sure how it's going to work. We still obviously have to wait for the EIB to select the banks. So it may take, may take a year, may take him two years before there's a Latvian lender. Um, so it's not something that's going to happen very quickly, probably won't happen in 2014. Um, but it, it's something that's coming and I think it's really quite an interesting proposition. I've got a very practical question. Is the value added tax included in the eligible expense? It depends, a real lawyer's answer. Um, if you're exempt, no. I mean, uh, if you can, you can, rec you know, recuperate it. Uh, there is a special then. Then there is a special case of public bodies. If they act as public body bodies, then no. So it's it's very very specific, and all this all the details are explained on what we now call the common provisions, uh, and in the future will be called the general conditions uh, to the grant agreement, which will be part of the application package. You can then look at all the different things: what is eligible, what is not eligible. Under, under life, and uh, some there have been some changes because the financial regulations of the United uh, of the EU um, budget have changed, and so it's, you know it's uh, new rules. Are there more questions? If no, maybe we can take a break in the program. It's uh, 15 minutes. Take some coffee, some snacks, and after 15 minutes, we can continue. And if you have some questions, you can ask privately.